I'd like to also thank the organizers for uh, putting together this event, which I think is really timely and a great contribution to the discussions and debate on international justice in general. And also I'd like to thank them for the invitation to the coalition for the ICC. I can only echo the sentiment that's been expressed over the past few days of the um, essential um, need for accountability for international crimes because of the contribution that that can bring to um, building respect for human rights and the rule of law, but also contributing to a sustainable peace. And I must express my firm belief that international justice mechanisms, such as the International Cr Criminal Court, have a very important role to play in this issue. So very briefly about the Coalition for the International Criminal Court. Our organization was created in 1995 on the heels of the creation of the ad hoc tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and for Rwanda. Um, it, we are very much independent from the International Criminal Court. We're a non-governmental organization. And as was um, very detailed, uh, explained by uh, the moderator, uh, we have 2,500 member NGOs from over 150 countries around the world working to ensure that the court is fair, effective, and independent, that justice is visible and universal, that states have the national laws <coughs> necessary to investigate and prosecute international crimes, and um, <clears throat> that these such, uh, such national investigations take place. I want to focus, as the name of my organization uh, implies, on the International Criminal Court and its um, contribution to international justice. Um, <clears throat> it was established in uh, Rome on July 17th, 1998. So clearly, 1998 was an auspicious year for global justice. It's the world's only permanent international judicial body that has the mandate to investigate and prosecute international crimes. And in fact, its jurisdiction, um, its material jurisdiction is limited right now to three crimes, genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity, with jurisdiction over a fourth crime, the crime of aggression, forthcoming, we hope, sometime after 2017. As has already been said, the ICC does not have universal jurisdiction. Its jurisdiction is limited, limited territorially, um, if you will, to, sorry, nationals of states' parties. And it should be noted that uh, all nationals are subject to the court's jurisdiction. There's no immunity regardless of the position which an individual holds. And the court also has jurisdiction over crimes that took place on the territory of a state party. The court may, however, exercise jurisdiction over uh, nationals or territories that are not um, members of the court. This can happen if a non-state party uh, voluntarily accepts the jurisdiction of the ICC by declaring its uh, acceptance through Article 12.3 of the Rome Statute, or if the UN Security Council refers a situation to the ICC, and this can happen irrespective of the nationality or the location where the crime was allegedly committed. Of course, the latter takes place within the framework of the UN Charter, Chapter 7, <coughs> regarding uh, the interests of peace and security. So ICC jurisdiction is also limited in time. Uh, the court only has jurisdiction over crimes that took place after the entry into force of the statute. So after the 1st of July 2002. And very importantly, and I think this was um, a main point of uh, Jose Ricardo, is that the International Criminal Court is a court of last resort. The Rome Statute clearly states in the preamble that it is the duty of every state to exercise its national jurisdiction over those responsible for these crimes. And this has come to be known as the principle of complementarity. In that respect, cases that have been or are currently being investigated or prosecuted at the national level become inadmissible before the ICC, provided, of course, that the investigating or prosecuting state uh, is doing so in um, a genuine manner. If, it, if they're deemed to be unwilling to do so or unable, that when, that's when the court's jurisdiction can be um, triggered. 
for example, if an investigation or prosecution is taking place at the national level, but it appears that it is simply to shield the individual from international prosecution, the court may uh, deem um, that it's necessary to enter into action. So in terms of the ICC's practice to date, uh, I can tell you that there are eight situations currently before the court. Um, four of them were referred by states' parties, actually by the states' parties themselves. Uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Uganda, the Central African Republic, and Mali. One state party, now a state party, accepted the court's jurisdiction under Article 12.3. As I mentioned, <coughs> this is a way for non-states parties to um, allow the ICC to investigate crimes um, it, it's the case of Cote d'Ivoire, which at the time of its Article 12.3 declaration was not a state party, but it subsequently became one in February 2013. Two situations were referred by the UN Security Council, one regarding Darfur Sudan and the other Libya. And uh, one situation has been opened using the prosecutor's proprio motu power, and that concerns Kenya. We see that uh, criminal charges have been levied already against uh, at least 36 alleged perpetrators. There have been 30 arrest warrants issued, nine summonses to appear, uh, at least that have been made public. We have one person who's been acquitted. This is Matthew Ngajolo Chui of the Democratic Republic of Congo. He was acquitted in 2012 of alleged um, allegations of uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity. And we have two convictions. Uh, Thomas Lubanga Diello, also of the Democratic Republic of Congo, who was convicted in 2012 and sentenced to 14 years for the recruitment and use of child soldiers. And the second conviction is of Germaine Kartanga, also of the DRC, who was uh, convicted this year, uh, found guilty as an accessory to war crimes and crimes against humanity. The sentencing decision for Kartanga is actually due tomorrow. In addition to these eight situations, which um, have evoked some criticisms from various um, individuals around the world because they do seem to be focused uh, in entirely on the African continent, but in addition to the situations, the Office of the Prosecutor of the ICC is also uh, conducting preliminary examinations into nine countries from other regions of the world. These include Afghanistan, Colombia, Georgia, Guinea, Honduras, Iraq, Nigeria, the Republic of Korea, and Ukraine. As it concerns Ukraine, it's a non-state party, which, as I mentioned, has accepted the jurisdiction of the ICC under Article 12.3 over the protests that took place in Maidan Square between November 2013 and February 2014. And an, another um, of these preliminary examinations uh, concerns allegations of crime, specifically detainee abuse, committed on the territory of a non-state party, Iraq, by nationals of a state party, in this case, nationals of the United Kingdom. And this, um, <clears throat> this preliminary, preliminary examination uh, was uh, opened, I should say reopened, uh, following the prosecutor's uh, use of the proprio motu power. So when it comes to challenges of the ICC and, and perhaps challenges to the court's contribution to universal ju jurisdiction or global justice in general, there, there's quite a few. And, and I, I don't want to put the onus entirely on states, but um, many aspects of the challenges faced by the court in its operations uh, do lie with the contribution, or I should say lack thereof, of states that are members of the court, but also states that are not yet members. And speaking of which, that would be the first challenge, is that the court, as I said, is not universal in terms of jurisdiction, but also not in terms of membership. There are only 122 states that are members of the ICC out of 193 UN member states. Uh, we have major powers that are not members. Um, very, very obvious ones uh, are China, Russia and the United States, which as you know are also all permanent members of the UN Security Council. This um, brings to mind, of course, the concern that it's quite unlikely that any of these three states 
would um, fall under the jurisdiction of the court in the near future, as long as they remain outside the system, given that uh, they would probably veto any UN Security Council referral uh, related to the allegations of their criminal responsibility for such crimes. This also, the fact of having three permanent UN Security Council members um, not party to the Rome Statute also impacts the role of the Security Council with regard to potential referrals of other situations involving other non-states parties. And we can clearly cite the example of Syria, which, as you know, for several years now has been afflicted by a horrible conflict. There have been repeated calls for the situation in Syria to be referred to the ICC with no success so far. There's currently a on yet another draft resolution on the table at the UN Security Council for referral of Syria to the ICC. It will be voted on in New York later today. Um, there's not much hope, let's say, that it will pass because, once again, um, part of the um, Security Council membership being not only non-states parties but having some potential political interest in um, seeing that Syria does not come before the ICC. Another concern, and, and this is perhaps, I think, um, even more um, important than the, the absence of major powers, is the absence of countries with some of the most uh, populous um, uh, communities in the world. We have countries such as India, Indonesia, uh, that are absent from the system. And this is concerning because by being absent, by, by having by their states not being part of the of the Rome Statute system, by not being members of the ICC, the citizens of these countries are effectively vulnerable. They they can't benefit from the pr protective shield that the ICC and the Rome Statute offers to civilians. So, universal ratification of the Rome Statute is um, by by states is less of an urgent necessity. A second aspect involves uh, implementation, and this um, <clears throat> concerns the legislative framework that exists at the national level. And there's, it's a twofold uh, issue. One it concerns making certain that the crimes that are crimes within the Rome Statute, so genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity, are also considered crimes as such at the national level. That way, when investigations and prosecutions of these crimes take place, that they are investigated and prosecuted as genocide, as crimes against humanity, and not simply as, as murder might, for example, be uh, investigated at the national level. States also need to uh, ensure that their national legislation has provisions to allow for effective cooperation with the court. And again, this is a point that Jose uh, Ricardo mentioned. Uh, the, as I said, the court is a... Um, uh, relies on this principle of complementarity where uh, states have the first obligation to investigate and prosecute crimes. But of course the court has very limited resources and doesn't have resources in terms of staff, in terms of finances, to cover all of the uh, cases, situations, preliminary examinations all around the world uh, at a great distance uh, without having the uh, effective and essential cooperation from states. And this cooperation can extend from executing arrest warrants to even providing uh, space for statements to be taken from witnesses in a particular case. Implementation is also obviously the place where states can decide to make sure that their national legislation includes provisions allowing for universal jurisdiction over the Rome Statute crimes. And I would stress also that implementation, we see implementation as something that doesn't necessarily have to follow ratification or, or membership of the ICC. We, even with non-states parties, uh, we encourage them to consider implementing the Rome Statute, making sure that these three crimes are crimes at the national level in their states, and even uh, providing for cooperation with the court. We have seen some non-states parties perhaps not go the route of actually uh, affecting um, change to national legislation to allow for cooperation. However, they have provided cooperation to the ICC in its investigations. 
Yet today we see that out of all the countries in the world, including countries that are not members of the ICC, that only 59 have implemented the Rome Statute of Crimes at the national level, and only 51 have uh, legislation that can provide for effective cooperation with the ICC. So implementation is yet a, uh, another uh, in priority for states when it comes to the Rome Statute. As was already said, cooperation of states is, is crucial. Um, the, the court doesn't have a police force. They can't send out anybody to go and arrest suspects uh, all around the world. Um, but we're, we currently see that there are 13 outstanding arrest warrants of the 30 that have been made public. And, and this is, is essential. We look at, for example, the president of uh, Sudan, who is subject to two arrest warrants and continues to to, uh, to remain president of the country, uh, to continue to, to live in impunity. Uh, he has even traveled to uh, the territories of states parties and has not been arrested. Uh, these include states such as Kenya. And this is, this is a major concern because, of course, uh, Kenya is a state party. It is signed on to the Rome Statute and has uh, committed to cooperating with the court and assisting the court in uh, achieving justice. But if it's, uh, it refuses to execute arrest warrants for people who are sought by the court, it's obviously a major challenge to the court's effectiveness. Another area for cooperation which is important and it perhaps is outside of the national legal framework, let's say, is the need to conclude voluntary cooperation agreements with the court. And these cover issues such as interim release of accused, relocation of witnesses, enforcement of sentences, etc. <clears throat> now, I would also like to, to build a little bit on what uh, Jose Ricardo said about the need for cooperation with third countries and potentially also within the context specifically of Europe. I think that there's quite a bit of inspiration that can be found with existing mechanisms for interstate cooperation when it comes to international crimes. One of these is an example is the European Union's genocide network, which is housed within Eurojust. And this is a network of practitioners from all EU member states. By practitioners, I mean investigating authorities, police authorities, immigration officials, etc. All those who have a role to play when it comes to investigating and prosecuting such crimes. Um, when, for example, a national of a, another country who may be uh, accused of committing these crimes is uh, present on the territory of an EU member state. And these Practitioners within the network meet regularly to exchange on individual cases that they are investigating and prosecuting, and also to cooperate in terms of, for example, if one state, let's say Germany, is investigating a uh, suspect, uh, they may um, team up with, uh, I don't know, Ireland, because they suspect that there is a witness on the territory of Ireland who could assist them in their investigation. So I think this interstate cooperation is, is something that's uh, very uh, essential to um, bolstering the success of the International Criminal Court, the principle of complementarity, and in the long run also universal justice. Similar, similar networks are being considered uh, in Africa, and there's actually a proposal on the table to create a network within the context of the ICC, which would involve all 122 states parties. So there is a movement towards uh, seeing uh, interstate cooperation with, uh, on international crimes as, uh, as a necessity. Another initiative that I would like to mention is one that's been put on the table by uh, Argentina, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Slovenia. And this is a mutual legal assistance initiative. It's basically a plan, a proposal to create an international treaty on mutual legal assistance and extradition in relation to Rome statute crimes to in, in order to facilitate and promote their investigation and prosecution. As you may know, of course, there are bilateral mutual legal assistance agreements, but by having an international treaty, this would just create the international framework for such cooperation, for extradition requests to be executed. And this could, again, uh, bolster the international criminal court system. So once again, uh, the onus is on states to make sure that they fully and effectively cooperate with the ICC. Unfortunately, this legal framework that I've mentioned is not enough 
to ensure that Rome statute crimes are effectively investigated and prosecuted, uh, many states are lacking um, the adequate infrastructure from courtrooms, prisons, centers where victims and witnesses' testimony can be taken without re-traumatizing them. We also uh, find in some countries that there's a lack of technical expertise. They uh, may have excellent uh, in-house expertise when it comes to national uh, crimes uh, or, 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 or criminal law, but when it comes to international criminal law, which is quite complex, uh, the expertise might not be there. Uh, it, this might also um, not necessarily be uh, from a legal perspective, but even when it comes to, uh, for example, police officers understanding uh, what types of questions to ask, what kind of evidence to look for when it relates to international crimes. Uh, this would also ensure that um, if such expertise is, is bolstered at the national level, the, um, once legislation is passed, it's correctly applied to investigations and prosecutions at the national level. Um, but even, even perhaps before all of this, I think education from basic awareness uh, raising to obviously the incorporation of international criminal law um, education in uh, the institutions of higher learning is, is really essential. And this is something that civil society works very much towards, is just raising awareness about the ICC and international criminal law and justice in general. Again, this... Um, can provide that there's a awareness of what international crimes are all about and why it's very important not only for international uh, justice mechanisms like the ICC, but also for states themselves, national uh, jurisdictions to to investigate these crimes. And this, uh, I think, makes clear that there's an important role for the international donor community to to ensure that there are uh, there's financial and technical support to national jurisdictions to ensure that they are in a capacity to fulfill their role, their obligation as um, as per the principle of complementarity. And when it comes to the principle of complementarity, um, aside from all the points that I've raised already about the requirements and obligations, let's say, of, of states. The, the hope has been that the, the International Criminal Court would act as a catalyst for national investigations and prosecutions because states would, would much prefer perhaps to uh, have the control over the investigations and prosecutions of their nationals or of crimes committed on their territory than, uh, let's say, um, giving up some of that sovereignty to an international mechanism. And we see that um, in the cases of, for example, the nine preliminary examinations, that there has been um, some movement to, to see this happen, that there are states, uh, and even with, with one situation, for example, Libya, which has uh, consistently claimed that it wants to and has the ability to, to try the suspects uh, related to Libya, in particular, for example, uh, Saif al-Islam Gaddafi. Um, I, I, I can say that uh, just yesterday, actually, the ICC Appeals Chamber um, rejected this um, request by the Libyan authorities and uh, demanded that uh, Saif al-Islam be handed over to the ICC, um, probably because of the assessment that Libya was not yet in a uh, state to be able to carry out a fair and effective uh, trial uh, in Libya. But all this brings to mind um, how effective the ICC can be as this catalyst for investigations and prosecutions at the national level. When we see, for example, that some of the preliminary examinations that have been opened by the Office of the Prosecutor have been going on for quite some time. The oldest concerns Colombia, which was opened or made public in 2004, so 10 years ago today. Um, it is questionable how successful that has uh, been as a catalyst towards national investigations and prosecutions. We have members in Colombia who question the, um, some of the uh, trials that have taken place at the national level, question whether they are really uh, seeking to investigate and prosecute those with the most responsibility for the crimes, which is the ultimate aim of the ICC. Questions also about the number of trials. I believe to date that's about 50 that would fall under the principle of complementarity with the ICC. 
And so we still have to see, perhaps in the years to come, how effective this catalyst notion will be when it comes to uh, preliminary examinations and the, the resulting effect on national investigations and prosecutions. But at the same time, I think that this certainly um, buttresses the belief that there is a need for an ICC. We can only imagine that if the ICC did not exist, if the ICC did not uh, undertake these preliminary examinations, what might be the case in some of these countries who would not feel the pressure of uh, an international spotlight, as it were, shining down on them to make sure that they are looking into the cases, looking into the alleged crimes and acting on that. So I... Um, there's so much more that can be said about the ICC. Um, I'm sure that many questions will come up about some of the controversies, um, some of the misunderstandings, some of the uh, reports perhaps that are seen in the media about accusations of a manipulation of the ICC as a Western or neo-colonial court. Um, there's uh, much that can be said about all of that. I'll leave that to any questions perhaps uh, later. I just want to include, uh, conclude perhaps on a sort of a positive note. Um, this uh, July 17th of this year marks the 12th anniversary of the entry into force of the Rome Statute and therefore the creation of the ICC. And I would say that regardless of the challenges that I've already cited and, and challenges that are, are no doubt forthcoming, for, for example, once the crime of aggression, um, once the court has jurisdiction over the crime of aggression, I think we must pay tribute to the fact that, regardless, we now have a permanent judicial institution at the heart of an international justice system that can, that has the potential to bring perpetrators of the most heinous crimes to justice, that can potentially deter the perpetration of future abuses, can help and reduce, uh, help, sorry, reduce and prevent conflict and widespread violence, and at the end of the day, contribute, as I said at the beginning, to the rule of law, the respect for human rights, universal justice, and hopefully one day a sustainable peace. Thank you. Well done, 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 done reality. Hopes are always higher than reality itself. But there are specific questions, though. And there are assessments as well. Which is okay, I think is okay, but I don't think it is the time now, because we do not have the time, actually. As for remarks, non-state part, non-party states that you listed, you said which they were, and so they are not under the obligation uh, or under the universal jurisdiction of, of the court. So the question would be, or the comment would be, are any expectations that you think that they will all be under the control of the court? So there are several questions on that topic, on the non-state, on the non-party states. And then some questions about Israel and Palestine. There are many more. And I beg my pardon to those that ask very interesting questions, but we do not have the time, and that are a very significant, with which, which will we refer to the organization so that Kirsten can, can reply to this using <laughs> These are two very, very uh, um, important and, and complicated questions to answer. When it comes to non-states parties, okay, so I did mention three major powers, the United States, China, and Russia, and of course, uh, some 60 plus more that are outside of the system. So what are their hopes for the ratification? I'll start with the easier aspect um, among the 60 or so others. There, uh, we certainly saw from the beginning of the adoption of the Treaty of Rome a huge, huge um, number of states that ratified the Rome Statute and became members immediately. Clearly that has wavered off. You have fewer states, uh, obviously, in the world. 
And there's all sorts of reasons why some states haven't yet joined the system. Some, as I mentioned before, in relation to investigation and prosecution, relates to capacity issues, even from a financial perspective. Some very small states, for example, island states, might not have the financial resources to embark on uh, what might be necess necessary for them to ratify an international treaty, for example, reform of constitutions or amending the national legislation. When it comes to the major powers, I think hope springs eternal. Yes, there's always hope that we'll someday see the United States, China, and Russia join the international justice system. I don't know if it will be possible with the current administrations. Um, I can speak um, to the, the change, and it was already mentioned earlier this week, the change in attitude of the United States towards the ICC. It was mentioned that at the 11th hour, the United States signed the Rome Statute, um, but then uh, under the Bush administration, in, in the early, uh, the first uh, term at least, uh, there was a very um, hostile approach to the ICC, uh, a, a withdrawal of the signature, uh, statements that they would, they would never join the ICC. Under the second term of the Bush administration and then under President Obama, we have seen a, a change in terms of their attitude to the ICC, being much more cooperative, um, attending the annual discussions of the Assembly of States parties that take place to discuss the functioning and the, and the practice of the ICC, and also even uh, engaging in uh, cooperation initiatives with the court. So this is, this is a, a positive change. I think we're going in, in, in a good direction, at least from the United States' uh, in engagement with the ICC, I still think we're far off from uh, the government agreeing to cede what it sees as an integral aspect of its own sovereignty to uh, an international mechanism. And on the second question, um, Israel and Palestine, um, we could have a whole other several week long Congress, I think, on, on discussing this issue. I know this afternoon there will be some uh, speakers from the court um, themselves, including the, the former prosecutor, who might be better placed to explain uh, the decision to, um, to, to, to not uh, act further on the preliminary examination into Palestine. Uh, as you all know, there is uh, continued debate about whether Palestine can be considered a state within the international um, law and, and how that would then apply to uh, the Rome Statute, obviously, the question of whether it's a state leads to the question of whether it can uh, be party to to the Rome Statute. And although um, several months ago we, we saw uh, Palestine uh, ratify several international treaties, the Rome Statute was not one of them. I'll leave it at that, I think. <laughs> Muchas gracias.